Welcome. This is the Life Enthusiast online radio and TV show, restoring vitality to you and the planet. I'm your co-host, Scott Patton, and joining us as usual is the health coach at Life Enthusiast, Martin Patella. Hey, Martin, how are you doing today? I'm actually doing good, Scott. So, uh, you know, last time we connected, I was the one that was a little off. And I'm noticing that today it's your turn to have your uh, tongue a little less agile than on your best day, right? Yeah, it's weird. It's I've said this introduction well over 300 times. And today, for some reason, it just... It's not going. It's and not you know, I have those moments. We all have those moments. And I'm thinking there's a flare of some sort, right? Like, I don't know what it is. Uh, it could be sunspots. It could be that you ate at your last meal something that's affecting you. It could be something as simple as you, you're breathing something that's just wrong. You just know? wrong, like, right? Yeah. <laughs> wrong, right. Wrong, right. And yeah, it's interesting too because it could, it also, it could be something that has not affected me ever, and then today for some reason that it did, it does, it did, it does. <laughs> well, I want to talk about the air, and you, you kind of brought it up, and what we're breathing, and I happen to be in Skopje, Mas Macedonia, almost yes, in Mesopotamia. <laughs> <laughs> which is just north of Greece. And it's a beautiful city. It's been conquered by the Ottoman Empire. It's been conquered by the Greeks. It was part of Yugoslavia before Yugoslavia broke up. It was part of the Roman Empire and some Greek Empire. I mean, it's, it's ancient. It's old. And it's fascinating walking around because you can see some, uh, some old buildings. Yeah. And yeah, well, let's just put put a, some cultural references in here. Like Macedonia is a really, really ancient, proud nation that kind of got melted into nothingness of history. But Alexander the Great, who was one of the chief movers and shakers of the ancient world, is from there, was from there, right? Yes. I think That's Mother right. Teresa came from there too, right? Pardon me? Did Mother Teresa come yes. from there? Too? Yes, Mother Teresa was born here and they have they have a they have a huge square and in the middle of the square is a huge fountain. On top of the huge fountain is a massive horse. On top of the massive horse is Alexander the Great. And just over to the right are four pieces of stone that they didn't remove when they paved. And there's a plaque on the side that says, this is where Mother Teresa was born. <laughs> like there's no house. It's just, yeah. you know, it's flat. And then there's this little yeah, bit of history rock. Wiped it out. It's right there. And then a little bit further, like this, the square has all of the roads coming into it. So it's like six spikes to it or spokes. And on one of them, when you go down is a, Mother Teresa Memorial Place. It actually looks like a house, but when you walk in, there's there's no house. It's just like on one side, it looks like a house. On the other side, it's like, oh, there's nothing here. And then they've got pictures of her and everything else. So yeah, there's, there's lots of history here. Lots of world changing people, you know, two at least have come from here. And in 1960 something, I think it was four, they had a very bad earthquake and it shook up a lot of it, a lot of the old uh, buildings were destroyed. There's a huge, I keep saying huge, but I mean, everything here is massive uh, fort, like stone fort up on the hill that you're, that oversees everything. And that, so it, they're still repairing things from 2000, 1960. I mean, I can't even put 19 in the year anymore. Uh, so, I mean, 50 years ago, and they still haven't fixed it up. And then they had a communist uh, time as they were, you know, it was all communist. And so everything was built along the, the communist way, like straight walls, little windows. So what they're doing now is they are putting a new uh, facade up in front of everything that looks Roman, Greek, ancient. <laughs> and it's hilarious, right? And unfortunately, yeah. some of the stuff that's been up for a few years, it's discoloring 
So, you know, they'll have this big column and they'll have this yellowing going on this one part of the big column, but not this part. So this part looks like it's brand new and this looks like it's kind of yellowing. So obviously the workmanship in some areas is not as good as it should have been. And uh, one of the comments that I made to my tour guide and she agreed was, you know, I hope that in 10 years this all doesn't look awful because it doesn't last. And then maintaining it becomes an issue. But it's, it's kind of interesting how they've gone about doing things. Mm -hmm. So there you are. I mean, to me, when I was growing up, uh, Macedonia was like the backwater of the backwaters, like, like you know, the ar armpit of the <laughs> Balkans. Like right. I would have never dreamt of going there because it was like we used to call it just uh, the Polish have a beautiful saying, pshak krev a cholera which means just dog's blood and cholera, <laughs> like nothing, nothing, you know, just crap. But anyway, so there you are all of a sudden experiencing their antiquities. And uh, <laughs> and the city is beautiful. There's, there's, an old, there's a number of old markets and bazaars that are just, you know, they're packed full of fruit. Strawberries are in season right now. They're just delicious. And, uh, you know, so I've been sort of wandering around and taking in all the city and there's sort of this modern part this modern part that tries to look ancient. Uh, and then there's, of course, the, like there's an old museum and it was, destro it was de destroyed, not flattened in the earthquake. And you can see, you know, they left it as a mem memorandum of the earthquake and it had a big clock tower and the clock tower shows five, uh, 20 after five uh, and 20 after five was when the earthquake hit. So they left and it stopped and they just left it at that time. Yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And where this so, uh, ties into air is the fact that uh, what's interesting about this area is it gets good rain, so it has lots of water. There's lots of areas around here where they have problems with water. They have all the water that they could use. They have a number of mountains around it, so Skofi is in the middle of a valley, and you know, so it's kind of protected that way and and, but unfortunately, in the winter time, you get this inversion, and all of the, sm the smoke and the dust and the smog stays, and it builds up and builds up and builds up, and it can be really awful. And one of the things that's running it, so, so part of what I wanted to talk to is about systems, right? Like the government has said, you know, we've had a communist government. Our utilities are like way underpriced. We need to bring the prices up to market levels or reasonable levels or sustainable levels, and they won't bankrupt us sort of thing. So electricity has increased and increased and increased. So now electric heat is exorbitant, and so people stop doing it, right? And what do they do? They go back to uh, these machines that burn pellets or wood, and the result is, is this smoke can... Um, well, smoke gets into the air and then it doesn't dissipate. There are no winds to take it away. It just hangs. And in the winter time, uh, my tour guide said she gets into a car and drives, you know, three blocks to the store because she just doesn't want to walk and exert herself in this air. And she has an air filter at home to kind of clean it. So she recognizes the, you know, the problems that she's going to have long term with bad air. Uh, you know, so good for her. There's, you know, 100,000 other, 200,000 other people here that don't. They're going to have problems later on. And should we be, you know, looking at our systems from a more holistic perspective where it's like, okay, you know, we make this decision. This is the result. Is that the result? Is that result worse than what it is we're doing now? Yeah, I've encountered this uh, in multiple places. Like I've lived in small town British Columbia, and uh, British Columbia is a whole bunch of valleys between fairly tall mountains. And so this is classic. In the winter, you get this low-lying cloud cover that just holds everything down. And so you get inversions. Like I remember when I lived in Invermere, um, you know, Invermere is 2,400 feet above the sea level and everything is socked in and uh, you can just drive for 15 minutes up toward the ski hill and uh, you pop up 
into uh, somewhere around say five six thousand feet and you're above the cloud and it's just gorgeous sun blue sky everything but if you stay in the village you don't see sunshine for weeks if not months you know from october to march it's just as awful yes and and in the small town a lot of people do the rural thing which there would be just cut wood and burn it in wood burning furnaces and it's quite dirty it puts out a lot of particulate into the air and uh, and it stays and it stinks yeah. and then i remember also back in czech republic where i'm originally from um early on when i was growing up everybody was heating with coal and oh. not just any cheap brown crap coal and so when they burnt that it has that sulfury smell to it oh and it and it puts out a lot of this pungent odor into the air and a lot of particulate matter too so again inversion and everybody's just choking on it and yeah. so then when when they modernized in 89 uh they started converting to um to uh, what they call it, earth gas, uh, natural, natural gas. gas. And um, they were buying that from Russia. And then Russia started uh, doing trickery. Yeah. And then EU started putting sanctions on Russia and not buying natural gas. And all of a sudden it started to get expensive. And so people started switching back to coal and it was just, it's horrible to go back from the clear sky, clear air, no problem, to this pungent, choking air issue all winter long, where anybody who has at least a wee bit of something like asthmatic or just uh, weak uh, on the lungs would suffer greatly. Right. And you reminded me of... Uh... My adventures in rural British Columbia, where I was in Prince George, which is a pulp town. So we have this valley. We have two rivers running through it. Well, the one, two rivers meet, and then it's one. And we've got three or four pulp mills that are strategically placed so as to maximize the amount of smog that would stay in the city. And you'd be walking along, and it'd be a beautiful day. And then you would see this wave of cloud coming towards you, and then it would just envelop you, like a horror movie sort of thing. And it would, it has this sweet, sickly smell. And of course, they called it this, that that was the smell of money, because the three pulp mills were what were the engine of the economy. And yeah. and of course, I would say things like, well, you know, this clean is, it up. This has got to be bad for you and they say oh yes it's very bad for you uh, but we have the world's best cancer clinic in town and that's how they dealt with it like what yeah yeah no we have so much cancer here when they put this big brand new cancer clinic here instead of in vancouver because we had more and blah 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 and it's just like so you, we're proud you, of it we're, we're proud, proud of our it. cancer clinic that's right you know we're the number one we're number one for cancer it doesn't matter what it is we're number one and so there was just no cons no thought to the solution to your economic problem is causing your health problems. Can you not find a solution to your health problems that doesn't kill your economic solution? And of course, they've gotten, I mean, this is 20 years ago. They have gotten cleaner and they have worked on it. And I'm not paying attention to it anymore. So I don't know if, if it's gotten any well, worse. I'll tell you what not. happened. I'll tell you what happened. People started using the internet and there's way less demand for pulp because pulp is the s stuff that you turn into pro paper, books and newsprint, especially newsprint. And the demand is going down and down. There's So pulp mills are closing. Nobody cares. Nobody needs it. Yeah, except the small towns are hopefully they're not closing too, right? Well, they are actually. That's that's the that's the other trend, the societal trend that I'm noticing is that um, the small towns are gutting themselves out because there's nothing to do. There are no jobs, right? Like when you close the pulp mill that used to employ 500 people, those were 500 unionized 
decent paid jobs. So each one of those was a head of a household that had probably a, a guy and a gal and a couple of kids. So the kids went to school, needed a teacher and a dentist and a this and a that, right? And they had dogs and cats, so you needed veterinarians. Right. So when you take out this 500 jobs out of the economy, it really takes out probably 2,000 people out of the community, which... These are the communities that are not growing. Like I, I saw the statistics for British Columbia, small towns up there in the interior that where extraction economy, either uh, wood or lumber, are shrinking. Mm -hmm. While the large cities, large centers, such as Vancouver, are growing because there are the opportunities of the new economy. Yeah. So everybody wants to be in the large center in the new economy. So there's this concentration of the fewer cities while everything else out there is depopulating. Yeah, and I don't think it's just in uh, British Columbia. I think this is happening in India, and it's definitely happening in China, and all around the world you have the subsistence level living and people are going, you know, I don't want to live like this anymore. I'll go to the city and hopefully something good will yep. happen. And Get a job. Yeah, and in places like Mexico City and Rio de Janeiro, those uh, promises are not Shanghai. happening. Yeah. yeah, Beijing, Shanghai, and other five, six, seven million population metropolises. Uh, how do you say a plural of metropolis? Metropolises, yeah, I don't know. Metropoli? Metro yeah, probably. Oh, I looked that up once, and it was something like... Metropoli or metropolis yeah, or that. something. Anyway, let's get back to air. air. We need to have okay, so air. The air. In if the big have, city. If we have big cities, we have even more concentration of more things that can cause massive problems compared to a small city like Skopje. Because you've got you've got the rubber from the tires that are wearing off on the streets. That's a very, Great very beds. fine dust that gets right into the lungs. You've got the industry that's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, the brake pads. The brake pads. That's, the, that's all that's wearing. They are made of metal. So you're wearing those and putting that into the air. And uh, all of the industrial stuff that's going on, whether it's a refinery or heating systems or chemical factories or whatever else you're doing. I know... <laughs> I come into one of those stores, like a, uh, I don't know, a large box store where, they, where they sell, uh, no, not, not construction, like Costco or the uh, Walmart, uh, Kmart, you know, all of those, they have this widest sortiment, sortiment of stuff. They sell everything from uh, soap to tires. Right. And... The air in this store, it just hits me like like a wall. Like I can't stay there for 15 minutes without feeling like it's oppressing and, and taking me down and I'm going to, oh. I just have to get out of it. Can't breathe it. Huh. Anyway, and that's because I'm spoiled because I'm breathing clean air where I live. Yes, right. That's the one thing you get once you get clean, then you get really sensitive to whether it's water, food, air, uh, clothing, or the environment. Yeah, true enough. Yeah, Which, artificial. I just actually thought of another thing. Like a lot of times, people talk about indoor pollution. Like as bad as we talk about the outdoor pollution, oftentimes in a home, the carpet is giving off stuff or the walls, the paint on the walls is giving off stuff or you have black mold. Uh, there's a lot or you know, heaven, for, you know, I'm, I'm just waiting for them to ban those fluorescent light bulbs that have taken over, right? Because you drop that and that's basically mercury now in your, like I've heard that if, that if you draw, I have heard, so I don't know that this is true, that if you drop one of these things, they basically seal off the room, get the hazmat guys in, and you can't go in until they've like cleaned it up. Well, it's true. That's what they do. I mean, it's overkill. 
but it it is true that it's filled with mercury vapor. So um, I guess if you really want to be careful, yeah, you don't want to inhale that. You would want to put on a very high grade uh, breathing apparatus and uh, and deal with it that way. Yeah, or put a big fan and just blow it out to the neighbors. <laughs> You, you reminded me of when I was in Medellin, I was in this hotel and the, the little lamp was a fluorescent light bulb and it wasn't working. So I called down and said, you know, the little lamp's not working. So they come up with this with the, the handyman guy and he's fiddling and fiddling. And, and so I'm just, like he's on one side of the desk, I'm sitting on the other, just sort of watching him, right? And he finally, you know, after about 10 minutes, gets it out, but it drops and it bounces onto the tabletop and then it bounces to go on the floor. And I don't know if like I was really good reaction or it landed in my hand. Like you can pick whichever story you like, but I caught it. And he looks at me and he had this like frozen deer in the headlights, fearful look. Cause if the thing had broken, I don't know what we would have done, right? Whether they would yes. have just said no worries, whatever, or what, right? But I caught it. No, no, no. no that would have been a hazmat event. <laughs> <laughs> so. But, you know, 40 years ago, when I was working part-time in my grocery store, we had fluorescent lights. We had hundreds of fluorescent lights in the ceilings, and they'd be out. So we'd get these massive ladders, like super tall ladders. We'd climb up, we'd get it, and then we were like, well, we don't want somebody to throw, we'd put them in the garbage, okay, and these big garbage bins. And then we, well, we don't want somebody to be, you know, fiddling around and then accidentally break and get glass in their eye. So smash them. So we were constantly smashing. We just put our head, you know, like, it wasn't that we were trying not to get the mercury. I don't think anyone realized there was mercury in it. It was, we didn't want to get the glass on us. So we would click it, smash it, we'd be smashed, we'd be done. And that was inside the store. So for 20 years, all the mercury that was in all these fluorescent light bulbs were, we were all breathing it in with no knowledge. And, uh, and now you're wondering why your liver shut down. That's, yeah. You know, why have I got gray hair? I'm only 32. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right. Like, I, and I don't know that I've ever been checked for liver. I should go and do that. Yeah, maybe. Maybe there's I mean, mercury. Mercury, whatever. Mercury, not, but anyway. There's definitely something going on for you today because your brain is is definitely. This is what a person feels like when they have been glutened, mm. right? Like what what you're exhibiting are the signs of a flare, like leaky gut, leaky brain. Something goes off, and and you just you just can't get it right. Like that, this is a classic words, symptom yeah. of. No, no, really. Classic symptom is mixing things, right? Like you, you, you will say, uh, "Hand me the broom," but you meant the vacuum cleaner, right. or, or you say, uh, "I was the hammer, in liver, but... liver vapor." <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean... Just, just mixing nouns. Yeah, that's classic. And then, then it, when it gets worse, you can't come up with it. Mm. Meaning. What's the actor's name? You can't think of the name of the person that you know, you know, you know, but you can't recall it. Mm. Or you start naming, give me that tool, the, the whatchamacallit thing. Right. Can't, can't think of that it's called uh, five-eighths wrench or whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyways, just, just pointing out this weird thing that's going on with you right now. Something happened. You have been exposed to something and it's showing. Right, right, right. Hmm. And, uh, and you need zeolite and fulvic acid to get out of it. I have fulvic acid and uh, humic acid, and I've been uh, taking a glass of each th throughout, like one in the morning, one in the afternoon when I drink it. Yeah, so, so hopefully, hopefully it will help you dig out of this. So uh, about the air, about the air, right? <laughs> So, uh, number one, indoor air quality is a huge issue. So there are off-gassing things in the carpet, and there are possible chemicals. Like my daughter, for instance, lived in an apartment where 
her window was just above a roof where a vent coming out of a restaurant was blowing all of the air out of the restaurant. Mm. And she happens to be gluten sensitive. And so they were blowing pizza dust on her all the time. Wow. And who would have known that when you're renting an apartment, that that's what you're going to get into. Right. Yeah. Like you wouldn't be thinking of, yeah. Or, or you can, yeah, or you're going to rent an apartment somewhere and your neighbors are going to start doing stuff. Uh, one of my customers called me just last week and was saying, you know, these guys in the apartment next door to me, they are making some stuff. There are smells coming out of there. Maybe they're cooking drugs. I don't know what they do, but there are these toxic smells. And so when they are around, I feel a lot worse than when they're not. Yeah. How about that? Right? Yeah. And so the only solution I can think of is either move or uh, or get an air filter. Right. Those are really the only two options that we've got, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. We we have actually uh, got a deal going with this Canadian company called Air Pura, where. Uh, they make a number of filters. They're specializing in uh, different applications. Like, you know, if you have an automobile shop, you have certain type of chemicals coming out, like hydrocarbons, exhausts, that sort of stuff, right? So you have that. Or, or if you have smokers, it's a different set of parameters that you want to deal with. So That's you, a really good you know, idea, looking at specific situations and saying, oh, we'll make a filter that's... For, I mean, like how many... Mechanic shops are there or little factories doing certain types of work? Are they in the world? I mean, that's a great idea. Right. Well, what if you are, you know, what if you have an office that is just back backed into a automotive shop, right? And you're just getting exhaust and who knows what else blown at you all the time. Right. I mean, it's it's a hazard. So we have we have a filter specializing for healthcare clinic that will deal with path pathogens and uh, antigens and that sort of stuff. Or, uh, I don't know. So do you want to talk a little bit about each one individually? Maybe the... Uh... Not really. I mean, uh, yeah, it just depends on so many different situations. I mean, there are nine models, pardon me, seven models, that uh, each one of them sort of focuses on the right application. And uh, some are less expensive than others, but either way, it's, again, as, as in most situations, you get what you pay for. You know, you can buy a, a little pocket filter for $200, $300, but that's not going to do the job. You need to go serious. Right. And there's a lot of air going through your house. Yeah, you need to understand the size of the place and the capacity of how much air you need to rotate. Like if you have a one-bedroom apartment, it's a different thing than if you have a three-bedroom house. Right, right. So one, the, of the, one of the things that they talk about on their, on one of the pages, I just want to bring this up so we can scare you into being healthier. See, some of the things that are floating around in your air are uh, dust mites, pollen, little droplets, mold spores, asbestos, tobacco smoke. And airborne chemicals include, this is a really good one, formaldehyde, great, ammonia, uh, benzene, oh, that's wonderful, radon, and all the different types of glues. That, you know, we, this is the thing you're talking about, indoor pollution. Like we buy all these packages of stuff because we need glue to do this and we need, you know, I don't know, cleaner to do that. It sits there and then it just, it's not airtight and you get the benefit of, it floating around the house for the rest of your life. Then it gets worse than it gets worse than that, Scott. I just watched a, an expose and a, a documentary about the Siberian tiger. Okay. So the si Siberian tiger is declining because his habitat is dis uh, disappearing, and the reason it's disappearing is because um, organized crime, call it that, in eastern Russia. Is, is cutting forests down in Siberia illegally, loading it onto trains and shipping it to China, 
where in China they will slice it into uh, stuff and turn it into uh, laminate floors, flooring. Okay. And uh, the laminate flooring is then sold to Americans cheap. So you get yourself a sweet, sweet deal on this laminate flooring. It's made in China. It's loaded with formaldehyde. The glue is just... Um, Number one, the glue is poisoning the people that are working on it, but it also is off-gassing sufficiently that it's poisoning the people that put it into their houses. Wow. So maybe nature knows how to do it. It, In your process of uh, killing the tiger, you're going to kill yourself. Right. And the solution, the solution is the guy saw it was, number one, you need to protect the tiger. You need to try and enforce the, the law in Russia. But for most and foremost, you need to stop buying crap that doesn't even comply with local um, safety rules. Like right. that stuff that is sold in the United States does not comply, but nobody's checking it. And it's cheap, right? It's cost, a, I don't know, a third off or half off of what you would expect to pay for flooring of that sort if it was made right. Well, I but guess not, that's a clue, right? Yeah, yeah, like there's no such thing as a free lunch. When when the price is way down, it's because somebody did something not right. Yeah, you remind me of the story of the lead paint in toys that were made in China and shipped to Walmart. And, the, you know, and the, the poor, Chinese guy says, well, you know, Walmart insisted on this price. And the only way we could get this price was to use that paint. Because yeah, the, be the better paint was, you know, otherwise. So if he right. didn't do it, somebody else would have done it, right? Not to, not to excuse Absolutely. Them. But of course. Yeah, and this, is, this is the thing the Chinese uh, get the bad rap for it. And I feel badly for it because they simply deliver what the purchasing agent is asking for or if demanding. You want demanding if you want quality they'll deliver you quality yeah. if you want cheap shit pardon my language they'll get you that that's right oh. Oh. <laughs> we live in a world scott that just has me shaking my head three ways it's all backwards right Every well it's us the consumers with the wallet who are dictating what is or isn't going to happen. So when I make my choices, I buy organic food. I don't buy industrial crap. I do not, period. But many of my clients are telling me, I cannot afford this stuff. And, and I understand it because they're in a job that does not pay them well enough. Because there are enough people who are willing to live on crap and therefore are willing to accept lower wage for their time. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, the, it's the poor people that are competing with other poor people for the shitty jobs that are depressing the wage. And, and then so it's the consumer who is buying, who's not paying attention and so is buying something that is made in child factories in Bangladesh or someplace. And, and, and so it continues as opposed to saying, you know what, I need to, well, it's, it's like when you go to the farmer's market and you get to meet the farmer and then you find out how they're actually growing the carrots that you're eating and how they're caring for it. Then you realize that I don't mind spending a dollar a pound more for those carrots because it's, grown with love and the proper proper way. Yeah. And at the level that uh, a person with a decent income can do it, sure. But when you're in one of those competitive jobs where you're just just barely making it, right? Like there's there's this lower end of the market that is uh, very competitive and you don't get paid better. And once once you don't get paid better, then you have only so much to spend. Yeah. And that, that gets crazy scary. And now, of course, we now have this stupid competition for 
real estate, for apartments, for houses, where uh, everybody's pricing everybody else out by willing to go up to here. Ah, if I stand on my toes, I can go up to here, right? And so we're now pricing each other out of decent living. Like I'm watching the the price wave in uh, urban British Columbia, and I don't know if it's everywhere, but gosh, that thing is just insane. People are putting themselves on the line for, I guess call it house poor. Yes. They will have a house, but they have zero lifestyle because there's no money left for anything else. Yeah.